Well, the new anime season is upon us, and that means it's time for the thing I look forward to the most. Another check from Crunchyroll! This time, it's for digging into the PV of Drifters, a new show from Hoods Entertainment, the makers of Mysterious Girlfriend X and a lot of high-quality smut, based on an original manga by Helsing creator Kota Hirano. Like many contemporary anime, Drifters focuses on characters who are spirited away from our reality to a fantasy world with elves and hobbits and other Tolkien nonsense. Unlike most contemporary anime, the characters here are prominent historical figures who have been brought to this world for their skill in battle as opposed to their ability to serve as a bland, masturbatory audience surrogate. It's a big, dumb, fun fighting crossover, basically, like Super Robot Wars for history buffs. Instead of Gundams and Avas, you have Oda Nobunaga teaming up with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid to take down Joan of Arc. Sounds like a hell of a show, right? And it sells itself with one hell of a trailer. By the way, just so you know, I am going into this almost 100% blind. I have only read the Wikipedia summary for the series, so I am basing all of my analysis off of that and the trailer itself. Nothing else. Operatic music swells as we open on shots of Japanese cavalrymen charging into battle, the famous battle of Sekigahara. And right off the bat, we see one very positive indicator of this show's quality. This animation team knows how to do CGI right. The animation loops of the soldiers are staggered so that they don't look like robots marching in perfect lockstep, and there are decent quality cuts of 2D animation mixed in for frontal close shots in order to paper over any deficiencies that the models might have. Plus, everything is composited into the scene well and looks like it's part of the world around it. You'd be surprised how many shows get that wrong. From here, we cut abruptly to Shimazu Toyohisa as he charges through the nearby woods to ambush and kill the enemy general, I Naomasa. He leaps out, wild-eyed, and takes down two enemies in quick succession before charging toward his target. The shots of the battlefield are very busy and chaotic, the camera moves all over the place, and the frame is full of moving parts. It's hard to keep track of everything at once. When we cut to the woods, though the camera work is still frantic, there's a singular focus on Shimazu and his target that elevates him above the rest of the soldiers that we've seen. And as if that wasn't clear enough, the text on screen describes him as the Sengoku era's greatest samurai. At the top of the title card, you can also see the date of his death. This becomes a running theme. Despite his skill, he comes away from the battle heavily injured. His disorientation and the gravity of his injuries are emphasized by the Dutch angles from which he's shot, which contrast with the more balanced, flat shots that we saw when he was on the offensive. It seems like Shimazu is done for, but as he stumbles through the woods on his last legs, things take a turn for the surreal. He suddenly finds himself in an endless hallway lined with doors, some sort of otherworldly clerk sitting at the desk in front of him. This is Murasaki, and you can tell a number of things about him from how he's presented. He's the type of character to have a lot on his mind at once, as indicated by his cluttered desk. He also appears to be a very diligent worker, since he has a pot set up to brew tea right next to him. The gloves with which he holds the paper indicate that he's somewhat fastidious, and the jumble of technology from different eras that surrounds him tells us that he's in some way disconnected from the regular flow of time, as if the environment around him didn't give that away already. His general attitude and the fact that he's casually smoking paint him as aloof and disconnected. I expect that he's results-oriented and doesn't have a lot of time for individuals with whom he interacts. What I especially like about his character design is that, on a surface level, he wouldn't look all that out of place working in an office building. Yet, in the context of what we've just seen, he looks very strange, and that calls your attention to things that would be odd even in a modern setting, like his gloves and those cold, dead eyes. Despite Shimazu's apparent protests and questioning of where exactly he is, Murasaki signs a paper that consigns him to be sucked through a portal to his right. Shimazu is scared out of his wits as this happens, while in contrast, Murasaki is entirely calm. This is routine for him. The shift in music here highlights something very interesting about this PV. The way that it mixes together a number of bombastic, classical tunes to punctuate the shifts in the story. An intense but traditional Taiko drum track suddenly transforms into the crescendo from Jack Offenbach's Orpheus in the Underworld, which in turn transitions into an odd techno song with more traditional Japanese elements mixed in. And from there, instruments and elements from a number of different musical backgrounds are brought in in turn. I'm not a music nerd, so I can't really name everything that's in there. 
And as Shimazu makes the decision to fight for the people of this new world later in the trailer, the background music explodes into the Toreador song from George Bizet's famous opera Carmen. Honestly, the clash between these different styles of music is pretty jarring, but I think that's kind of the point. Musical elements are taken from Japanese and European culture in equal measure and bashed together to make something new and attention-grabbing. This fusion of music works, but it's violent and chaotic, much like the blending of historical figures from different cultures in the show itself. It's also worth noting that many of these songs come from comedies, which tells me that the show will have a certain air of reverence to it. After Shimazu passes through the gate, Murasaki introduces us to two more Japanese historical figures. Oda Nobunaga, the Demon of the Sixth Sky, which is a nickname that he gave himself in a letter, and Nasuno Yoichi, a samurai from Japan's Heian era who was famous for his skill with a bow. Of course, along with their names, we see both of their death dates. Yoichi's is displayed as August 8th because historically he has no specific agreed-upon date of death. Nobunaga comes across as arrogant and brazen, in keeping with his historical reputation, and in line with the classic shonen trope of the sleazy old badass. Yoichi, meanwhile, comes across as a different type of cocky, more slick and self-assured, like a pretty boy. We don't learn a lot about these characters aside from their attitudes, but if they're our core group of protagonists, I think it'll be fun to see them bounce off each other. Groups of anti-heroes are usually a blast to watch, and I'm not the only one who thinks so, because we see See these characters are being observed by Olminu of the Octoberist organization, who apparently serves as something of an audience surrogate in this world, as well as the comic relief. Then we're introduced to the fantasy world itself, and it's far from idyllic. As the title on screen suggests, this world is embroiled in war, and there are a lot of tensions between demi-humans like elves and the human population. Fields are raised in a systematic hunt of the local elves by the Orte Empire, a genocidal human regime that was founded by Adolf Hitler. As you'd expect from that, they refer to the elves in decidedly racist terms, calling them insects. Yeah, from the looks of things, this story gets pretty wild. Shimazu decides that he won't take this oppression lying down, however, and charges out of a wall of flame to attack the Imperials. In this moment, we see his heroic side in action, but also his totally crazy side. It's clear that he takes great joy in the thrill of battle and revels in the chance to fight. His manic, predatory instincts are greatly emphasized by Hirano's artwork. From this point, the music shifts into the show's theme song, Vermilion, and the intensity picks up. We see flashes of action, paper talismans go flying, a gatling gun fires, monsters line up to do battle, a mysterious group, I think the evil group called the Ends, stands beneath an eerie moon, and Shimazu artfully slices an opponent into bloody pieces. Then we see some choice action shots, plenty of bodily dismemberment and a soldier being shot off his horse by Oda Nobunaga. There's not much hidden meaning here, it's just meant to impress you with how cool and exciting it looks, and it certainly looks cool and exciting. There are a few things more exciting than a fighter plane flying alongside a dragon though, at least when you see it in something other than Gate. The plane is piloted by Naoshi Kano, a pilot of the Japanese Imperial Navy whose favorite phrases are apparently, you idiot and you bastard. Naoshi seems to be reveling in the chaos and bloodshed. Bloodthirstiness looks like it's a common trait among the drifters. Speaking of them, from here we're introduced to the rest of the cast, including Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and Hannibal Barca and Scipio Africanus, two ancient military commanders who have a lot of history together. Extra Credits did a fantastic series about it, if you're curious, but who seem to have a begrudgingly friendly relationship in this new world. I'm definitely interested in seeing the anime's take on all of these different historical figures. It's clear that Hirano chose characters who would be interesting to write about, as a opposed to just famous war heroes with good name recognition, and I'm hoping that that will make for a lot of fun exchanges. Lastly, we're introduced to the antagonists of the story, the Ends, a group of famous humans from our world who have given up their humanity and become monsters. This group includes Shinsengumi Vice Commander Hijikata Toshizo, a decidedly homicidal-looking Joan of Arc standing alongside her old companion Guy de Rey, 
Anastasia Romanova and Grigory Rasputin, and the enigmatic Black King, their leader, who hasn't been identified yet, but is probably some sort of famous historical figure. Not a lot is given away about them, but again, I'm interested to see how this show portrays them. One fascinating thing about the Drifters and Ends is the way that in this world their roles are kind of reversed. People who are seen as mercenary or violent in our world become heroes here, whereas those who are revered and elevated above their humanity end up stripped of it and becoming villains. It's a clever inversion of expectations. There are, however, members outside of these groups. Minamoto no Yoshitsune is Yoichi's former commander, a dishonorable tactician who acts as a free agent for whatever side is the most entertaining. And then there's the Octoberists, a group of magicians who fight the ends but aren't aligned directly with the Drifters. Alminu is the show's comic relief character, as I explained before, while the famous Japanese mystic Abe no Seime acts as the group's leader. Golly, that's a big cast and a load of historical information to process, but with a bit more action, we finally hit the title card. As a good advertisement should, this PV is following a nearly ideal interest curve. It starts with a moment of high intensity, dies off, then ratchets up the action in a quick succession of peaks and valleys. It hits a pretty high peak as Shimazu takes on the humans who are attacking the elves, and from there it's almost pure action as the theme song Song plays and we see increasingly ridiculous fight scenes unfold. I'd say the absolute pinnacle is when we see the dragons fighting World War II fighter jets. That's just too cool to top. Things dip a little as the character introductions play out, but they're intercut with brief flashes of action to keep you engaged. And the whole thing culminates in this pulse-pounding moment where Shimazu, engulfed in flame, hurls his sword toward the camera. As I explained in my Haikyuu videos, by following this formula, the Drifter's PV leaves you feeling hyped and itching to know what'll happen next. Fortunately for you, you can find out exactly what'll happen as soon as it airs this Friday, October 7th at 8 a.m. Pacific on Crunchyroll.com. And if you use the URL Crunchyroll.com basement to sign up for a free trial, you'll be able to watch it for free in HD with no ads along with every other show that they have on the site. Plus, if you want to see it dubbed, you'll be able to see that a few weeks after it airs on Funimation.com. Once you've seen it, come back and let me know what you thought of the show in the comments below, and while you're down there, tell me how I did with this analysis. And if you want to see even more analysis videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to Mother's Basement and turn on notifications, because I make them like every week. For instance, last week I did a follow-up to my last Crunchyroll sponsored video on Mob Psycho 100 and analyzed the show's gorgeous ending theme song. You can check that video out over here. I want to thank Crunchyroll for sponsoring this video, as well as my infinitely patient and loving patrons who make it possible for me to do this for a living. You're seeing some of their names on screen right now. And while I'm at it, I've got to extend special thanks to the lovely and talented Yazi, aka Tenlaid Cosplay, who helped me out by translating all the dialogue and text in this PV. Yazi is amazing, and her tweets are lit AF, as the kids say, so I highly recommend following her at Tenlaid on Twitter and checking out some of her fantabulous cosplay on Facebook. Links in the doobly-doo. Finally, I want to thank you. Yes, you, for watching this video. It means so much to me that you care what I have to say about anime. And also, you're making me just so much money. So share this video with your friends! As always, I'm Jeff Thu, Professional Shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.